Welcome. It has just gone 7 p.m., the 29th of June, and you are watching episode 54 of Regional Wrap. Regional Wrap, providing an insight on the issues affecting regional Australia and giving a voice to regional residents. My name is Bill Bates, and joining me on this episode, Kicking Goals, the Townsville Enterprise School Board, is my guest, Richard Norris. Richard is a member of the Townsville Enterprise Limited team responsible for government relations, stakeholder engagement, and media space. He has a passion for the development and advancement of regional and rural communities in the North. Richard grew up on the Atherton Tableland and Bundaberg before moving to Brisbane for university studies. He spent the best part of a decade traveling and working in tourism operations across Europe, the UK, and Southeast Asia before returning to, to undertake further studies. On completion, he began work in communications and public relations with Glencore in Mount Isa and Concurry. Again, bitten by the travel bug, he set off working for premium travel brands running large tour groups in Central Europe. Once COVID ground international tourism to a halt, Richard returned to Australia and took up a challenging, challenging yet rewarding role with the Danish communication team working on the Carmichael project. Richard joined Townsville Enterprises in 2021, taking the opportunity to work in a role that focused on the betterment of the regions and its community for the development of opportunities and growth for the residents of North Queensland. His role consists largely managing communications, media relations, and assisting, assisting the CEO with policy and government relations. Welcome, Richard. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for your time tonight. Um, if we can just start off the discussion in regards to, you, you can fill us in a little bit more about your misspent youth. I'm sure you're obviously a person who got up to some mischief. <laughs> and some of your adventures in, in your travels. And then maybe just touch on the Carmichael experience because um, although from your time scale, you would have come on, on board there as they sort of got over the worst of their pro, the protests and sort of got the project over the line. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> look, I sort of... I. Uh... I'll go back a little ways just to give it all a bit of uh, some context. I um, studied journalism at uni and uh, the, the, the journalism lecturer said to the class of 400 people, most of you will never be journalists. The world's trade, uh, changing. We don't know how that'll work, but you won't be. And uh, they, were, they were right. So I embarked on a range of different careers sort of working through sales and marketing positions. And about 10 years after that, decided that it was um, time to go and have a look elsewhere. So went overseas and ended up working with a tool company running large group tours around around Europe had a lot of fun um had a it was an incredible time and and did that for like I said about six years the first time and then went back for another couple of years later on so that was great but um you know you've got to grow up eventually don't you so I uh, came back to Australia at the um end of 2019 and uh, yeah there was a there was a role in the communications team that um with Adani working based here in Townsville um on the Carmichael project. And yeah, they'd, they'd, they'd reached that point that the, the role was developed to provide communication support during the construction phase of the project. So you're exactly right. They'd managed to get over the hurdles. They worked out what they'd, I guess, um, probably hadn't gone so well for them earlier on in the piece. They'd brought on a new management leadership team sort of a, a, about a year or so earlier um, with some of the names people might recognize now, like Lucas Dow. And, um, and uh, they you know, got over those speed humps and they had the, red, the green light for production, or sorry, for construction, I should say. So that's when I joined the team and I was um, based in Townsville and would obviously head out to site quite regularly to, uh, yeah, provide the communication support, media response, um, proactive uh, communications, pushing outward our key messaging and a lot of internal communications, stuff around safety and the site environment and things like that. So, uh, Great role, very, very, uh, you know, challenging, as you can imagine. I mean, if I wanted an easy role, I would have just gone and worked for, you know, Greenpeace or the Red Cross <laughs> or something. So I'll find someone everybody loves, right? Uh, but uh, no, this was one that I thought was a, 
it'd be challenging on a range of fronts. And it was um, an excellent team who worked there. And, uh, you know, a lot more, uh, there's a lot more complexity to the Adani story than a lot of people realize as well, um, in terms of the work that they're trying to do to bring, you know, three to 400 million um, Indians out of poverty, have them, you know, be able to switch on a, or flick a switch on the wall and turn on the lights at home. And, um, you know, that's a, it's, it's a very easy thing for people to look down their nose at, I guess, which is sort of what happens in the metropolitan southern regions. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, uh, they're making a material difference to the lives of a lot of people. Um, and at the same time, you know, world's largest solar production company as well, uh, solar energy production company. I mean, they're, they're rapidly and, and very strongly embracing a, a, a decarbonisation platform as well. So uh, a complex and very interesting environment run by some really passionate, very interesting people here in Australia. I think the other thing too is, Moving to Townsville uh, Enterprises, you would have seen um, some of the interconnection while you were at, at Adani because um, Townsville Enterprise and a good many of the people in northern Queensland and central Queensland were, you know, hoping and pegging a lot on, on that project going forward for employment, uh, growth, uh, enrichment of the uh, economy um, and it, it's sometimes a bit of a bit of a challenge for regional centers to sort of say well this is needed and although people in Sydney and Melbourne have got a particular view you, you can't just fold up camp and just um, say well we've got we've got to follow you know their dialogue sort of thing mm. um, so it, it would have been interesting you would have had, a, had contact with uh, Townsville Enterprise before we actually moved there. Yeah, that's right. Townsville Enterprise came out in support of the project, the the Adani, the Carmichael project, um, uh, in a in a big way. And that was, I think, that was key. Uh, I think it was in. The, I won't say it was key. That the, the team at Adani and many people advocated very strongly, but certainly Townsville Enterprise throwing their weight with four hundred odd members and and. Um, North Queensland's largest peak and peak economic development and advocacy body was an important, I think, ally to have. Um, you know, it, and, and look, at the, at the end of the day, uh, just to touch on what you said there, uh, it, it's very easy, if you don't live here, it's very easy to forget that about the material difference a project like the Adani project had on the region. And at the end of the day, it was something in the order of you know, $2 billion spend or something like that. Um, and the figures that they were publishing at the end were about a billion or sort of um, well over, I think it was a billion, was invested into regional companies. About 88% of that uh, was into Queensland, sorry, about 88% of that into regional Queensland companies. Now, this is a byproduct of many things, including the, the decision by some of the major contractors to walk away and not be engaged with Adani because of shareholder pressure and activist sort of threat, I guess. Uh, but what that did was unlocked incredible opportunities for smaller operators who may or may not have had the chance to work on a project like Adani at the end of the day. So probably required a bit of a shift in the way that project management was run and procurement and packaging up the jobs and things like that. But the net result of that action was that regional Queensland got a far big, bigger bite of the cherry than they would have otherwise. And I mean, yeah, to anyone who's sort of, you know, negative toward the project, who doesn't live in a regional part of the world, I'd just very simply say, you know, um, would, would you be willing to stand up for, you know, what you feel you believe in um if it meant putting your hand in your own pocket and and having a paycheck taken away having an economic opportunity away it's very easy to be passionate about something when it doesn't actually impact your ability to pay the bills or send your kids away to a school or or you know pay the mortgage on the house those kinds of things but that is the reality for regional queenslanders and projects like the carmichael project so the other thing about townsville enterprise um, it's not just Townsville. If, if you read some of the narratives, you, you talk about um, Hinchinbrook and, and sort of Charters Towers and down even to Mackay and that, so, and the Burdekin. So they're outside your regional uh, government area, but Townsville Enterprise is much more encompassing uh, than a lot of what, chamber of commerce type things and 
and even my perspective of um, advanced cans, I, uh, I think Townsville Enterprises is got a it got got a much bigger overview of the whole region and maybe even reaching out as far as Mount Isa to the farthest extent extent of the borders. Yeah, so we our our uh, I guess our footprint. Um, these days, we do encompass the five local government areas around us. So obviously centering on Townsville with uh, the Burdekin to the south around to Charters Towers in the west, Hinchin Brook uh, to the north of us. So I guess where Townsville is that little sort of pocket in the middle when surrounded on the landlocked side by those three regional councils and then Palm Island as well um, is uh, we, we're engaged with as well. So we have those five um, regional councils, that's our footprint. But as you say, we do extend beyond that and typically out toward the West. And I think the importance there is realizing, that, you know, first and foremost, we are really all about the opportunities and the ways in which we can uh, promote and grow and, and connect our region. And for us, I, I guess that logical one is that supply chain out to Mount Isa, because we do have the port, the port of Townsville um an excellent facility and it's where the vast majority of material from that western corridor um if it's heading overseas or if it's going seaborne that's where it goes through so we have a i guess our, our immediate footprint are these five local government areas but then we do extend out we do quite heavily engage with uh yeah, all the way out to mount isa um Incitec pivot glencore out that way um uh, yeah, so, you know, about a thousand kilometres west from here, we've, we, we, we engage with regularly and work with on project strategies, advocacy. Yep. Well, well, the natural development of Queensland was through a port system. I mean, you had Rockhampton, Mackay, Townsville and Cairns as the primary ones, and they would become the service hubs or regional centres for those regions and pushing out, out west. Now, Rockhampton pushed out with a railway line. Uh, Townsville pushed out with a railway line and went so they had much further reach west. Um, Mackay, not so much. They did, didn't have that reach. They're, they're really a, 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 a circle type area lumped around uh, Isaac uh, Mackay. Yeah. Uh, and by default, Cairns was the service centre for the Cape and, and further inland just on, on that peninsula. Um, although we, we did have railway, <laughs> some rail act access in the olden days, but that's sort of um, gone by the boards. So that was the natural progression and growth of, of Queensland coastal and regional areas. So of course that's just natural. Um, in regards to Townsville uh, Enterprises now, uh, can you give us a bit of a rundown on sort of recent uh, Tick, tick and score runs on the scoreboard. Yeah, so <clears throat> we've got a few. Um, I mean, I, I guess one of the big ones is we've touched on is 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 a and, and and I'll make this point: we're we're an advocacy body, so um, you know we we. we our ticks on the school board are things where we've obviously had that major contribution and, and led the advocacy or been a big part of the advocacy to get something over the line and contribute it. Um, so Adani was obviously a big one. And, and as I said, the net impact of that on the Queensland economy, um, thousands of jobs, billions of dollars spent here, just in the timing had it during, during COVID, which was obviously a fairly... Um, a fairly big hit. One of the other big ones in um, Townsville here was the development of the stadium. So the uh, Queensland Country Bank Stadium here in town, um, it was being called for for a long time. The previous stadium, the 1800 Smiles Stadium is out on the far side of Townsville, out on Kerwin, um, or out in Kerwin. So I should say the edge of Kerwin, it's, um, which is, I guess, the Western hub, that Western side of town, but it was fairly removed from the balance of the nightlife zones and the sorts of th those kinds of things. So, um, especially after the Cowboys win in 2015, there was a big move and we'd had some runs on the board and built some momentum 
So getting that stadium into town, three hundred odd million dollar spend comes in every time we have a sellout event. It's about another somewhere between two and a half and four million dollars into the local economy on the uh, for, for those major events when we sell it out. You know, the State of Origin, the Cowboys and Broncos games, things like that. So big economic driver for the region, um, big enabler. We had during again COVID had you know the Matildas playing New Zealand there, an international soccer match, first one played in Northern Australia. We had the rugby championships, so South Africa, New Zealand, and Australia coming in there. We had the Oceania Rugby Sevens, State of Origin, obviously, I think I mentioned that. So um, in terms of right here in town, that's been one of the big ones that we've um, been a part of for virtually all of that journey. And we're a big force in getting that over the line. Um, other things we've been looking at, uh, I mean, at the moment, big supporters of the channel upgrade. There's a widening project on the channel now, which will increase the capacity of the ships coming through. Um, we are looking at the Museum of Underwater Art, which has been listed on a number of, um, I guess, you know, your TripAdvisor and your Condé Nast Traveller and those sorts of things as, as one of the must-do experiences, sort of if you're traveling to this part of the world or even globally, um, partnering up with the internationally acclaimed um, artists based out of the UK to produce um, the Coral Greenhouse and a series of structures and things which have been featured on BBC and, and right around the world and sort of really boost the tourism um, credentials of our region out at John Brewer Reef up to the northwest of Townsville. Um, in terms of defence, we were working hard with the Australian Singapore Military Initiative, which is sort of to the northwest of Townsville up near the Green Bank region, once again involved in the advocacy and, the, and I guess that um, presenting the united voice of the stakeholders to get that one to, to, to assist in pushing that one along and being a part of that project and bringing that into the region. Uh, countries like Singapore, you know, they have a, a very direct and real um, requirement for military training capacity and military engagement with allies, um, with their proximity to, um, you know, um, to, to, to Asia and some maybe some, um, so, you know, countries like China, which are proving to be troublesome geopolitically potentially. Uh, so they're very keen on having access to enough land to train on, the facilities to train on, um, and access to uh, to be able to train with, you know, allied forces and allied nations. So the ASMT, the Australian Singapore Military Training Initiative at Green Bank is another big one that's been um, it's, that's been significant. We're working on a, on a range at the moment, the development of the hydrogen hub um, here in uh, Townsville is something that we've been um, integral to, um, bringing the proponents together to, to achieve hub status and get about $70 million worth of funding out of the federal government at the last election. It was a bipartisan agreement, so we managed to get both parties bringing that on board. Um, likewise, uh, funding for Hell's Gates, which was partisan, only one side, and so we've obviously got some challenges ahead of us in regard to the new government coming in, but, you know, that's a that's a part of the game. It's a process. And then yeah, we're working on ones currently like copper string, uh, connecting the Northwest Minerals Province to the national energy market, um, which will have a, a whole range of benefits beyond just cheaper, more reliable power out to the Northwest. So, uh, yeah, we work across a number of spaces um, and, yeah, had a, had, a, had a few hits, a few wins along the way, which we're very proud of. I think one of the big differences between Townsville and Cairns is your diversity in regards to industry and what you can uh, chase after or even want to chase after, whereas Cairns doesn't even look in those areas. They, they restrict themselves more into the, the tourist sort of industry and stuff like that. Like you just mentioned um, you're widening your channel and and uh, for larger shipping and stuff, well, we've got the situation where we're, we're fighting, you know, tooth and nail for dredge, large scale dredging to uh, improve the access for the larger cruise ships. And, and I mean, over time, I mean, with the sabre rattling of China and that, there may be a requirement to actually upgrade just for warships and stuff like that in the future. Uh, but instead of getting a decent sort of um, dredging project, we ended up with some half-hearted thing that sort of, you know, got an extra, extra foot depth and maybe an extra metre wide. And it was the most expensive dredging model in regards to we pumped all the sludge to land. Uh, so for nearly, I think it was a couple of hundred million dollars, we basically got something we'll, which over time will just resilt up again. So. It, it's it's a bigger challenge for us in regards to we don't have that overall um, 
enough diversity around the Cairns area to take on and get these bigger projects over the line. We, we are very uh, lucky in that regard. So in, if you look at, if you do an economic breakdown of the Townsville region, um with well, north queensland region i should say the, the the five local governments no one sector is more than about 15 percent of our economy so whether you look at that being defense whether you look at it being public service whether it be agriculture mining tourism um or any of the others they uh, we, we do we look we're blessed it, it's a complex economy so it's, it's a diverse and a complex economy which um in some ways is a blessing, offers plenty of challenges too, you know, just to get a critical mass of workforce in certain economies, different times of the year can be more of a challenge when it is that spread. But um, it does, as, as you've said there, as you've rightly said there, it does give us some advantages, some opportunities um, to, to, to advocate across a wide range of issues, yeah. Well, just moving on to water security and that, I, I remember, um, it must have been about, 2017 or so um your storage got down to about eight percent or something and well good rains that actually did a lot of damage um so that was a problem but it basically it basically saved townsville from you know getting to the situation where it might actually have to think about trucking water um now since then obviously they've put a lot more effort into the horton pipeline and other sources than that so where are you with uh, water security at the moment? So water security was, I mean, we had, we had some fantastic early winter rain. So we had the dam back up to 90 odd percent, which is um, sweet relief. Uh, look, the, 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 I guess the big challenge is, or one of the big challenges is that there is a, there hasn't been a new significant water storage facility built in North Queensland in about half a century, okay? Uh, last big one, I guess, probably being the, the, the Burdekin in the late 60s and into the 70s. Um, when, without the construction of the pipelines, uh, the Horton pipeline system connecting the Burdekin catchment over to uh, the Ross Weir or the Ross Dam, um, it's down to about two years. It's not a lot of water security in this region. Um, and so we do now have the, the, the pipelines connecting the um, Burdekin Horton water scheme over to Townsville. They've got one pipeline in, there's a, there's a duplication and they're looking at what they can do there. So we, we have some relief on that water security front, but to a point, you know, um, they're predicting, we've got modeling done, looking at the region over the next decade. And they're talking about there being sort of, you know, another look at a, a net growth of about 30,000 jobs, right? Um, as a bunch of industries diversify, grow, government expenditure in the region, region will grow as population goes up. And so there's going to be a, an increased drain on the available water supply we have already. Then we're going to be looking at, um, there's a big move toward the diversification of agriculture. Sugarcane's been a, an incredible crop. crop. It's, it's been a crop that has built North Queensland to a degree, but there are moves afoot to, to diversify because there are other crops that add to the uh, agriculture mix for farmers there are other crops that uh, provide a you know greater return per hectare um a lot of economic diversity security for the for the ag sector here but they require additional water storage as well they require the ability to take some of our seasonal water and hold it in stream or off stream so it can be utilized and yeah one of the farmers up in Hinchinbrook um I was up there toward the end of last year actually and he was talking about it he said you know we have a water license to pour water out and and so in theory I can irrigate and I could grow something else but we don't have any in-stream storage so I can only take that water when that river's running when there's rain and that's when I don't need it when I do need to irrigate is when there is no water in the stream. So yeah, there, there, there are cha cha challenges like that. And then when you look at, um, you know, North Queensland, Townsville has been identified in a, a series of studies as, as an area that just has, you know, a, a, again, a bit fortunately, a, 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 a mix of attributes that'll make us a very competitive global hydrogen producer, green hydrogen producer. And there are big moves afoot to capitalize on that, to cement our position there. Um, uh, quick smart so that's going to require water as well you know hydrogen is h2o or without the o right so we really need to ensure that we have that water capacity for a growing population increasing diversification in agriculture as well as new industrial uses and um 
that's where there are some concerns and that's where we're looking to the future and we're looking at things like Hell's Gate Stam um, and other projects in that burdock and catchment and, and, and elsewhere where we can within the regulatory and environmental requirements that we have to work within, um, you know, look at starting to capture some of that water. And the other thing that's hitting us there with water security that we can't ignore is the fact that, um, you know, we, we're seeing distinct and definite shifts in the way that rain is falling in the region. You guys, I'm sure, will be seeing something similar in Cairns. What we're seeing, we're seeing the same kind of volume of rain falling, but it's falling in shorter and more intense periods is the sort of the meteorological and the, and the, and the groundwater data collection we've got here. And so that means you need more volume. You know, your ability to hold water storage is about the amount of water coming in um, over the volume of storage you've got and how long it sits there, things like evaporation and, and when the next influx of water comes. So that's why we're sort of really uh, pushing on, you know, whether it be Hell's Gates, uh, which we did the business case and our proponents or, or, or any of the other ways to manage the water systems in our region, looking at ways to improve the way that that's done because all of that, everything you've I've, I've said in the last five minutes there, bringing it all down, we're going to need more water in the future. We haven't built more storage for 50 years. We're going to have to do it soon. So let's do it the right way, but you know, we have to, there's, there's not really two ways about it. Well, I think in, in Cairns, it's a sort of different, a similar sort of scenario, uh, but it's not, it's just a matter of drinking water actually. Um, we're now going to tap the Melgrave River. That's the project that they've come up with, which I, I think is uh, <laughs> just a project to minimise the green impact so they don't have to do anything serious like, you know, actually build a dam. And, uh, and that's all fine, uh, except when the flow of the Melgrave changes or something, well, then, then you've got a, a problem because you... You're taking it from a river system, but you haven't got any storage for it. You can only only take it while it's there. So you're not taking and putting a year's worth of water somewhere on, on, on sort of as, as insurance. You're just using it as you go sort of thing. So if there's a problem with the river or something at one stage with its flow, well, then <laughs> we're in, in the same problem with no storage. And I think, I think that's very short-sighted in regards to the overall needs of the whole region. Um, with, with the Hell's Gate um, scenario, now you lobbied for that and sort of lobbied and got money to have a study done or an assessment, which you then got a consultant firm to, to look into. Is that right? We've been big proponents for a while on a solution to the water storage challenges. And, and I'll put this in place about Townsville Enterprise and about this project specifically. Townsville Enterprise's job, probably should have said this right at the start, our, our job's not um, to look at, rephrase, our focus is to look to the future, five to 10 years out, identify where we're gonna be, what we're gonna be doing and, and be working now to have that groundwork done. So when we get to the time, we're in a place where we can start to tackle some of these challenges, you know, work on these projects and whatnot. So uh, we've been a proponent of the concept of improving the water storage situation in North Queensland for quite some time. Um, out of those, the Hell's Gate Stam scenario has been on the table since the 30s. It was originally slated as a part of that, you know, original Bradfield scheme. It's not the Bradfield scheme. It's not a part of the Bradfield scheme. It's a totally separate thing. You know, I've mentioned Bradfield. <laughs> we won't mention that again. Um, but what it, uh, but so, and then, so yeah, we were given, we were provided funding by the government and tasked state and federal and tasked with doing a feasibility study initially. Then that was handed in and delivered. The findings out of that were sufficient that we were then tasked again um, to undertake the a detailed business case, which is what we handed over to the state government in um, at the end of April, uh, just gone. So, I mean, we are that we, we've been the proponents for that particular water storage project um, in the Burdekin River catchment or the Burdekin River system. Um, uh, more broadly, we're proponents for doing something about the water storage issue. Um, but we do have now that body of knowledge, you know, on the Hell's Gate Stam project, which I, I, I imagine there's no one else would have the same level of understanding and knowledge that we do. We, you talked about consultants there, there were a range of people. You know, it was $24 million, two and a half, three years 
um, you know, I think the final document somewhere in the order of two and a half thousand pages. It's a detailed business case. There's a lot of information. There's a lot of data in there. Um, still don't know everything. And uh, so that we had a range of consultants, uh, economics firms, engineering firms. There are a range of people working across a range of fronts. They're trying to put that together or putting that together, I should say. So uh, yeah, a lot of external help. We managed and facilitated and pulled it all together and, and, and I guess published the document that was handed over to the state government initially who um, you know, peruse and assess and then it goes off to the federal government. That's that internal process up there that we don't see. Um, but yeah, a, a lot of um, professional external consulting help was required. There's no, no, no way it could have been an internal job. Far, far too big, far too big. But, but, but you, you know what you forgot to do. You forgot to include Bob Catter on the bloody team <laughs> because it didn't meet his requirements. <laughs> but there again, you're never going to satisfy everybody. Well, look... <laughs> What's the, where, where, <laughs> thank, thanks for bringing him up, uh, for bringing Bob up. <laughs> Bob is an excellent advocate for his region, for North Queensland, the KAPR in broad terms. Um, uh, the reality is, and, and, and where we're bound with, is that the terms under which we received the money to do the business case was on the Hell's Gates business case, Hell's Gates Dam business case. We had to follow and abide by the current environmental regulations. We had to follow and abide by the requirements for environmental flow and things like that. There, it, it, it wasn't carte blanche to do whatever we wanted. It was, here is some money to study this scenario. Um, and you know, that's what we had to do. Now, Bob is a big picture guy, as we all know. Um, and he has his dreams of the Bradfield and you know, irrigating far inland. And it, that's great, but it was just not out in our scope. purview it was out of scope it was, it was, it was just never going to happen with the way that we were given that grant and the deed to to do the job that we did yeah so um just just uh, touching on another water project that's sort of uh, flying under the radar a bit i suppose is the burdekin dam and mm. sun is looking at increasing the capacity there by uh, raising the wall about two meters or something yeah, I think now, two to six metres, they're, look, they're looking at yeah. a variety of scenarios, yeah. Now, that that doesn't fit with the original Stage 2 plan that when it was built, there was already a, two, a Stage 2 plan sort of in, in you know, done, done and sort of documented. Uh, the water, the actual catchment area was actually, the land area was actually bought and, and secured for uh, the future Stage 2. Now, the future stage two was a 14.6 metre uh, increase in the wall height. Put in a spillway. Now, a spillway is... Ex the Burdekin Dam at the moment is a weir. I don't care what anyone says. If you haven't got a spillway, it's a weir, you know? It's just a big block of concrete blocking the, rock, blocking the water flow. It's Until you put a spillway, it's not, not a real dam. But anyway, this is another... But, and the other thing is it provided a for, and it's already actually in the wall, a, a 500 uh, megawatt hydro. Hydro, yeah. Or hydro now station, that, yeah. yeah, but now with today's technology, you'd probably get a gigawatt in there, uh, in that same in that same area sort of thing with, with the flows and, the, and of course the improvement in technology over, well, uh, Burdekin's finished in 86. Uh, so, so a lot of water's flown through over the, over the dam or over the weir. Um, so th there's a lot of advantages there for going ahead with that project. But if Sun Water goes ahead with its project, you'll never get the 14 metre wall on top of whatever they build. It will, will stifle the actual full potential of the dam. Um, so I don't know whether a Townsville enterprise has got a bit of an overview of what's going on there or interest, but that would actually uh, give you enough water for many generations to come if, if that wall, wall height was uh, increased to the original, original plan. Yeah, look, there's a weir. Um, what we've ended up really looking at, I guess, is the, is a, obviously having delivered the detailed business case on Hell's Gate Stam and taking a look at that, it becomes, you know, very clear we need to look at everything with it. You know, the, the, the ideal way to look at this is with a whole of Burdekin approach. We've also got Uranodan, you know, 
Urana Dam to the south, which feeds into the southern end of the Burdekin system. They're looking at the Bowen pipeline to take additional water out, the Horton pipelines. We've got the northern and southern Burdekin irrigation districts, I guess, the irrigation zone and then the natural delta. So it's, it's, a, it's a complex beast. Um, it is a complex, complex river system. The geology, the hydrogeology through the area um, is complex. There's a lot going on. There are a range of factors that need to be managed. Now, when it comes to the raising of the Burdekin Falls Dam, the stage two, uh, whatever moniker it's going to have, that's a Sunwater are doing exactly what we did with Hell's Gates. They're doing a detailed business case. Uh, it was commissioned to them at about the same time as we did ours. Um, you know, Sunwater is a government owned corporation, uh, really probably won't attract that same level of public attention that the Hell's Gate Dam did. Um, but they're essentially the two projects kind of running in parallel and they're both being delivered up to the state and then um, to have a look and I believe the federal government as well, having a look at that because funding may well come from there. But th these will be projects that are you know, ultimately the end of the day, right? Built and owned and managed by Sunwater, you would imagine. <laughs> yeah, look, there, there are there are arguments. The, the broad argument that we're on board with is that there's a lot of room to improve and maximise the way that water is used in the Burdekin River system. You could, and there's probably also true that there are many ways to skin this particular cat. Um, you could do a Hell's Gates and a smaller raising here. You could do just a huge raising here. You could do the Urana and not something else. There are a variety of ways. There are trade-offs with all of them. Um, and it'll come down to the decision being made by the various departments and the governments of the day as to which ones are going to go ahead. Um, it, it, it is, I feel it's slightly simplistic to say, do the big raising on the Burdekin Falls Dam and that's water for everyone. Um, because what you're faced with then, you're faced with, you know, you, you've got the water there, but you've already got an at capacity lower Burdekin. You know, what are you doing with the water now? Um, is it just there for the drinking water? Can it be utilized for the future? Does it you know, fit, the, um, fit the requirements for, whatever other purposes that water might be there for. The, the Hell's Gates project opens up 60,000 hectares of new irrigation potential, around about $800 million a year of economic outputs, about $6 billion worth of GDP. So you won't get that same economic drive out of that low one. You'll get, you might get uh, a different water model out of it. You might get potentially warm water out of it, uh, warm water, but more water. But will you get the, those same economic drivers out of the project? So there are a lot of questions. Um, that some people who are all paid a lot more and a lot smarter than me will have to work out what they're going to do with. Um, but we're broadly speaking, we're on board with whatever result can be shown to deliver the best economic outcomes to the region, which does include the lower Burdekin and sitting down below the dam. You know, they're, they're, they're a key, they're, they're absolutely reliant on the viability and the success of the dam. And uh, so they're, they're a key customer and a key part of that decision-making process. I think the other thing is too, I mean, uh, regardless of what people think, the constitution provided separations of powers and responsibilities and the states were left with water. And sometimes I feel that the state governments and especially the Brisbane state government sometimes just lets regional Queensland and bodies get involved in, in things and do things that really it should be planning from the start. If it wants to, if the Queensland pie is going to be grown, you would think the people, the planners in the state government area uh, who actually control all the money and it's regardless if it's, if the Commonwealth gives you some money, it doesn't give it to the project. It gives to the state government to deliver the project. No money comes in from the Commonwealth and just gets plonked in council. It goes to, Brisbane to deliver the project under certain guidelines and that's it. Now, to me, I think in looking at Townsville case and especially in, in Kansas case, the state government is not driving the, the thing. It's being, when something is complained about enough, they'll deliver something. And, and I don't think that's the way of a state government should be working. It should be having it a grand plan to deliver growth and grow the economic pie for everyone in Queensland. And I don't know how long you have heard about it or that, but you know, we've got to grow the North, Northern Australia. You know, mm. we've, we've had a white paper back in 2013 and all this sort of stuff. But I've, I've seen actually zero 
big infrastructure projects signed up for Northern Australia in general. And I think the last real major project goes back to the 60s and 70s in West Australia when their state government delivered the Ord River. But in Northern Australia, there's no multi-billion dollar infrastructure project that's been thought up by the state government and delivered it. You know, it's like drag, drawing teeth, you know. We, if you want something, you've got to draw the teeth out of them sort of thing. Well, no, wake up, do something. You know, this has got potential. Uh, do, you, do you think there needs to be, a, although we've got a regional Department of Regional Development, do you think they, you, they need a bomb under them or something to sort of get up and grow the pie? Grow the pie, that could be the new hashtag. <laughs> I think that um, I think that. Well, let me first. I'll move on to what I know. The first thing is I don't know is that most of the challenges facing Australia at the minute are going to be solved by regional Australia, and many of those probably have the capacity to be solved in northern Australia. Um, when you look at energy, when you look at minerals, when you look at you know, uh, there you know, there's a global trend toward decarbonisation, facilitating that here in Australia, so we can take advantage of that economically at the least. Uh, these things can all be and all will be solved feeding Australia. These things all happen in the regions and all happen. Many of them can happen in northern Australia. I feel that, uh, and look, I'll be I'll be careful here. You know, we are an apolitical organisation. We are um, we we we're very. I guess we we work as productively as we can with who we have to work with to the to the betterment of the region. Um, I, I think that broadly speaking, you know, in broad terms, it's hard not to agree that there's probably more of a metropolitan or certainly southeast corner focus in this state. Um, and it, I guess it does irk a little bit when you look at, say, the economy in the state over the last couple of years with COVID, you know, where basically the engine room that kept it ticking over was regional Queensland, northern Queensland, the ag and the mining specifically, um, keeping Queensland in the black and putting it in a position to have the windfalls that it's experiencing at the minute. Uh, so it is frustrating to see vast sums of money getting siphoned out of the regions and sent to the southeast corner. Um, and, you know, an example is the new royalty on um, mining products, on coal specifically. We're really hoping and we, we, we're preparing to work closely with the government to ensure that this doesn't become something where the, the revenue earned off the backs of regional Queensland is this funneled down to pay for things like Olympics and Cross River Rail and a series of projects down there, which, um, you know, don't necessarily impact or improve the livelihoods of, of, of regional Australia. So, look, I've, I might have danced around that a bit because I'm trying to be careful, Bill, but no, look, that's, I, that's I, I, I see you, I, 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 uh, I, you know, it'll be hard to disagree with the general sentiment you've expressed there. And, uh, and especially when I look at the potential that regional Australia and northern Australia have to solve many of the problems that we're facing. Um, I think it's, you know, there's room for a lot of money to be spent up here. And, and I think that that money would be delivering returns locally, state and nationally, um, you know, far beyond probably what a lot of people realise. Well, I, th I think that's the, that's the key. The potential is in the regions. Uh, you're not going to be able to put a hydrogen project at Potts Point or in Turak. You're not going to be able to dig up or, or, or in... Uh, Bella Clava down in Sydney or, or the Western suburbs, you know, it's got to happen here. And, and after COVID especially, uh, the federal government's clocked up a trillion dollars worth of debt. Uh, we're not going to ruin ourselves in Queensland's uh, debt thing. And so the real key to get out of this mess is grow the economy um, as much as possible. So the only, only area that you've got to actually grow the economy and generate wealth is in the regions. I mean, a cross river tunnel, you cost your, uh, your plan to spend five, five billion, it ends up costing 12 billion, but it's, it's not, a, it doesn't grow the economy, if you know what I mean. It's, it's an ongoing liability that you've got to maintain. It's not going to bring anything in other but than a few fares, uh, rail fares that, and you usually find most rail fares are subsidized by taxpayers anyway. So. So you've got a multi-billion dollar spend there, but with the equivalent multi-billion spend in the regions, you would probably get a return of several several times what you're invested in. 
And, and that's my point in regards to grow the pie. I mean, and that's the only way we're ever going to get out of this debt situation that we're currently in. Currently in. I think, and the really simple, just to make a concrete example of what you're talking about, and I don't know the latest figures on Cross River Oil, what it's cost. I hope it's not $12 billion. Um, but uh, whatever it is, for, for about two, you could build copper string. And what copper string is going to do, as I said, uh, I think a bit early before the show started, there's a number of things that it's going to do. But it's, it's first, the first and most simplest in its original intent was to connect the Northwest Minerals Province to the national energy grid. At the moment, we've got, you know, on paper, it's about 150 bucks a megawatt hour. Anecdotally referred to as up to about 300 megawatts, a dollars a megawatt hour, compared to an industrial customer near Calide where they're paying about 70 bucks per megawatt hour. The price of power out there is, is uh, exorbitant to say the least. Reliability is an issue for them. Um, and connecting them to the national energy market would, you know, in some cases drop the power prices, the power inputs by a third. The difference that makes to mining operation, the viability and profitability, profitability is, is incredible. What that also does though, is makes a whole bunch of other projects that are not yet shoveling ground viable. There's about three quarters of a trillion dollars worth of minerals, critical minerals and traditional minerals in the ground there, waiting to be pulled out for a world absolutely starving for that kind of stuff. For a two billion investment, you know, which I know Cross River Rail costs a lot more than two million, for, two, for a two billion investment, sorry, you make that connection where you start sending power out at up to a third of the cost that they're currently paying, which is a massive increase in the viability of these projects and a huge, huge economic winner for the region and for the state and, and indeed for the nation. So yeah, to, to your point exactly, there, there, the money could be spent on some key projects in the North that would have paid huge uh, exponential returns to the nation over time. Um, possibly more than a tunnel under the Brisbane River. <laughs> the other, other thing with copper string, it, it's actually really a, a backbone if you think about it, because off that extension of the grid and interconnect, you can run off left and right, north and south, whatever you like, um, other connectors to additional wind farms or whatever to get them on the grid. You can also run other projects so you can increase um, industry activity out there and also even things like uh, electricity for things like cotton gins and that and there's another discussion that's sort of coming around in regards to the uh, agricultural sort of changes in regards to happening is there's there's a lo lot of interest now in cotton and the fact that there's now cotton varieties can that can be driven in uh, in a large way in uh, sort of drier environments, you know, like you're talking about out at sort of um, uh, Croydon and, and right out to Burktown. And it, oh, I think even Catherine's getting a, in Northern Territory is getting a cotton mill. So what's happened in, in the cotton industry over the last 10 years is sort of a, a major change in what the conditions that they can grow these new, new species under. Yeah, it's, it's more than a power line. You're exactly right. The, 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 Industries and um, I guess regional capabilities that something like copper string opens up are, are, are incredible. And you know, you make that point there about the you know connecting wind farms and the like. But I know we chat about that earlier as well. It's the the economic value of uh, being able to provide green energy certificates, green energy credentials to um, other customers on the grid. In like I say, in a world we have uh, international delegations, um, ambassadors, trade ministers coming to Townsville talking to us, um, major international companies saying, we want minerals, but we do need them to be, you know, produced with, you know, renewable power. They're a part of our decarbonisation effort. So we need them to be produced in a, you know, certified green manner and whatnot. And, you know, th th these are private companies that are coming here, preparing to pay top dollar for our stuff. If we can do some basic things like put in this power line, um, it opens up the, the, the concept of green hydrogen, which is going to essentially change geopolitics. Green hydrogen is going to change the way the world operates the power bases globally. Um, but again, it needs that connection. We've got out near Hewland and we have you know, Geoscience Australia, CSIRO, they've pegged it. It's, it's one of the premier renewable energy zones on the planet in terms of the way that the sun and the wind interact with each other, um, the capacity to get it from there back to a, to, to a major grid, um, the room that's there, the, the amount of sunshine that it's got, it, it ticks every single box along the way. And what that does now, whether that be running cotton gins up to the north, or whether that be you know splitting water into hydrogen, 
um, over here at Townsville, or whether that be, you know, powering elevators, at, you know, lifts at the mines uh, out in the Northwest Minerals Province. Uh, the, once again, the, 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 the return on investment is incredible and enduring and ongoing. And it, it, it's, 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 it's a little bit mind blowing. It hasn't happened yet, to be honest, but you know, we'll get there. We will get it over the line. Actually, a few weeks ago, I had a discussion with uh, Professor uh, Peter Newman over in Western Australia. Now he was on the IPC, uh, C, uh, I think he was on the third working group, uh, which is mitigation and adaption. And while COVID was on, it was quite interesting over in West Australia, which, you know, we don't get a lot of news about West Australia <laughs> around the place, but uh, they opened up a couple of mines that sort of extract lithium, but not in the, the salt format, it, it, but in a hard rock format. And they, they are making a buck and a half out of that. And, and the interesting part about it is the, it's like all mining in, in, uh, operations. You've got to dig a hole first and you've got to take over burden out and all that sort of stuff. And, you, and, and sometimes it's amazing, you know, like if it's anything associated with green, the sort of <laughs> the, the, uh, if the environment sort of uh, criteria sort of seems to be cut down because they, they've got a massive mine in the Darling, Darling Ranges in Perth. It's just, they just obliterated a great big hill. Now, if you're going to take a conventional thing like um, coal out of it, you'd probably never get it because all the greenies would protest. But because this is associated with uh, renewables, it basically got a tick in the box and it's producing very good amounts of uh, lithium in, a, in rock form, uh, which is extremely valuable. And they're basically for, forward sold stuff for years in advance. So, so that's the things that can happen in the sort of, the new economy, but all that happened while we were in, in COVID and so it, it didn't surface much, but I have done a little bit, bit of research on it and, it, and it's earning and earning good dollars for West Australia. And look, and that, that there's, there are those same kinds of projects waiting to unfold right here. You know, the, the, the Vanadium prospects um, out around Richmond, sort of sort of a little bit out, I guess it's, you know, it's your next town out as you head past Hewenden. Um, you know, globally significant, uh, vanadium deposits there and the big attraction of vanadium is that um you know big batteries you know you know swimming pool size batteries um incredible sort of life cycle capacity and a whole range of improvements and efficiencies over lithium that you know they're only downsizes they're big and they're stationary you can't chuck them in a car or put them in your phone or whatnot so that you know the market for things like like, like vanadium we've got that same sort of thing happening here and as technology continues to evolve and move and change and you know very smart people all over the world come up with new ways to do things and, and harness the way that electrons move you know there's going to be opportunities like that and the the demand for some of these minerals is going to go and the technology and the understanding of how to mine them and get them out of the ground and process them is all going to change um and and we need to be ready to capitalize on those opportunities. We sort of, you know, you need to you need to have all your your, your you need to have your house in order. So when those opportunities arise, you can jump on them and maximize them. You don't want to get to that point and then and then you know, oh, then we've still got you know five years of building a power line ahead of us or, or whatever else. You wanna you wanna have that critical infrastructure, that enabling infrastructure in place, um, so you can jump on these opportunities when they arise. Well, just on that point, um, the Cape, I mean, we had um, Brett Duck, who's a geologist, uh, on some last year. And we, he basically had a, I think it's been around, around the traps a few times, uh, a, a diagram of a mobile phone. And then all, this, all the minerals and that re required, and then arrows out to all the places in Northern Queensland that, that uh, have reserves of these. And now Cape had quite a few. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of Cape. Now, <laughs> we, we need that to be opened up. And for that, we need a, need a decent road system to get there. Uh, I presume you've heard about our Coranda Range Road and the, and the story that's been going on for the last 30 years when it's just had another rewash in, in uh, the last 12 months. 
Um, <laughs> has Townsville, Townsville Enterprise got any anyone willing and able to sell, help us get, get the Coranda Range sorted <laughs> out? <laughs> I do know the Coranda Range, many trips up and down that as a young fella. Um, yeah, we, we, another thing, Townsville, we like the, the, the biggest range we've got here, I think, is the tourist road up Castle Hill. So that's nice. It you know, <laughs> takes a lot of those challenges away. Um, uh, look, you know, we, we, we're all pretty busy at the moment. But look, yeah, it's, it's even things like that. I mean, I guess it's a case of you just got to get everyone together. It's having a united voice. It's having that... Um, it's having a group and an organization that will pull all of the stakeholders together. And, you know, when you get everyone together singing off the same song sheet, the, you know, the, 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 the value of that is greater than the sum of its parts. You know, that's, that's, that's what you've got to get. Well, I, th I think the overall knitting or meshing is just the conversation on Northern Australia. I mean, the conversation has been out there for at least 15 years in a major way. Uh, since the Abbott White Paper and things like that. And then you have the Northern Australia Infrastructure uh, Fund uh, going out there. But until we get this full mesh between the Commonwealth, the state and the local players, we're probably not going to reach that potential um, in, a, in a proper coordinated way. It's going to be a stage dragged here and a stage, uh, and a stage drag there. Uh, we're not going to have that co cohesion. Is is there any is there any talk or methodology in regards to getting all the stakeholders from the Commonwealth to the state to all the people in Northern Australia to get to get a rocket <laughs> under Northern North, Northern Australia? I mean, we launched a rocket the other day in Arnhem Land. So I saw that. Yeah, yeah, we can, did. Can we can we actually fire the whole thing up for everyone's benefit? Because this parochialism, no, it's it's okay in one sort of way in in support in sporting means and that you know you can have from friendly parochialism, you can have banner and and challenges and it usually gets the best out of people. And after the game, it doesn't matter who wins or lose, you go and have a drink and whatever, and you sort of uh, walk away as, as mates. But sometimes I get the impression that um, in the world of commerce. Um, petty jealousies and, and envy can sort of come into the sort of thing unless unless you get this meshing or better meshing between all the parties. Yeah. What you say is exactly right. I don't I'm not sure how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> look, and, and look, it, you know, I, I think the I think the problems. Yeah, and I, and I hate to. This is this isn't my tendency. I don't. I'm not a problem dweller. I, you, I like to look mm. where we can go. You know, po po positively. Yeah. I, I think some of the. I'll free phrase it this way. I, I think some of the challenges are um, it, the tyranny of distance. To you know, quote a term. Um, yeah, we're out of sight and we're out of mind. Um, and you know, Bob Bob Catter talks about that well. If you ever have a chance to listen to Bob and he's ever putting on a, uh, if he's ever you know talking or presenting um he he dwells on that he talks about that he just talks about the fact that quite often i think if someone sits down and takes a look at the white papers and looks at the evidence looks at the economics looks at you know the nation as a whole they realize the, the potential uh that's there and what's on offer from regional from northern australia i feel that um maybe when it comes down to um you know the nuts and the bolts of it everyone is so bogged down with you know look there's electoral success matters you know where where are the most seats like you, there's, there's no point having a great plan if you can't stay in power to execute it right so the emphasis slowly but surely i think returns to where the the, the population critical mass sits the, the population density is uh i think it i think it'll require political stability i think it'll require um you know uh, once upon a time i would have said political alignment you know you'd have the same sort of you know political persuasions up from your local through your state to your federal but i don't know that 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 actually makes a difference i don't think that that's worth much uh or as much as i thought it was once upon a time um look i've just said a lot of words there without providing an answer bill i'm sorry mate it's a good, <laughs> it's a question for the ages mate if you ever work it out you uh, like, obviously uh, you're practicing for having a run in politics in the future <laughs> oh gee. <laughs> <laughs> not a chance mate you couldn't pay me enough 
you couldn't uh, pay me enough. Just, just, just to uh, wrap up because we've gone over the hour. Um, the census data was out today, and there's obviously a few interesting uh, figures in that thrown up. Uh, the final sort of washout uh, won't be known for a couple of days with certain figures, but uh, the Cairns region now, uh, I think that's one of the differences between Cairns and Townsville is uh, when you're talking about Townsville, it's sort of a bigger city population than what Cairns is, but actually the responsibility that Cairns has got to deliver services to and engage into, the population population is much greater because as you go out of Townsville or well, go and, <laughs> until you hit uh, Charters Towers, there's there's not a lot. But you know, we go up the up the tablelands, we've got Atherton, we've got Mariva, and then you move it move move further further afield and, and that's a significant population in, in that greater area. So we're just looking at and it hasn't been confirmed, we might just be touching over the three hundred thousand figure for the SA four area of Cairns. Now that's that's huge uh, in regards to <laughs> it puts us population-wise on this as a service centre bigger than a Townsville. So, you know, there's a there's a need for us to pick up the ball game and sort of make sure we get the services to match that population. Uh, Townsville has uh, its figures, population growth hasn't been as as high as Cairns, but the most amazing one is Mackay. Mackay's had the biggest return of population over this the five year gap because they had a big turn down with when there was a problem with coal and that but that came back with a vengeance and I think that their figures were up uh, you know 14 15,000 or something over the five year period which which is big big news for them and cementing their their place so there's sort of uh, interesting figures we're going to be able to delve in over the over the next few weeks but it does sort of uh, set the situation where uh, Cairns and Townsville are going to be challenging each other again for services and that as we go forward. But we would hope they go in unison and both areas, you know, get get the share of the pie and will add to the pie in the future. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, and 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 it is that, as I touched on before, you know, the the value of you know unity in terms of your advocacy efforts it's it's always greater than the sum of its parts and and definitely I, I would argue that you know really uh you know from the tropic of capricorn north um you know there's there's, there's probably room for a sort of a, a broad consensus amongst you know you've got advanced rockhampton i don't know what mccoy's got but you know townsville enterprise you've got adv um, advanced can so there's uh there is absolutely, and the, you know, the Whit Sundays region through there, and you know, the Bowen Basin, which I fall in, in into that bridge between McCoy and Rocky. There's, there's a huge amount of value, huge amount of potential, huge number of challenges, um, and, and you know, every dollar that you spend in the city to provide a service, you need to spend more in the regions. It's just a fact. Distance is greater, costs are greater, health challenges, socioeconomics, all those things present a whole range of challenges. So we do, we need, we need, we need our fair share, and that fair share is, is you know maybe proportionally more per person than it is in the cities. And that's fine because we deliver on that and we do need to work, I would argue, yeah, absolutely together. Um, geez, may, maybe anyone north of Noosa would probably come on board. Um, once you get out of that southeast corner, I think there's a real need to ensure that the, what regional Queensland can offer and what regional Queensland deserves are, are, are kept front of mind at those in, in Brisbane. Just touching on last sub, one last subject before we leave, and I mentioned it before. Um, obviously, groups like Townsville Enterprise and Advance can. Has, have they become more important now in regards to the sort of uh, the greater focus of the Crime and Corruption Commission on, on councillors and things like that that puts them under a lot of scrutiny and pressure? in regards to it, their engagement with business and the public sort of thing. Um, do, you, do you think the role now for CAN, CAN's, uh, advanced CANs and, and Townsville Enterprise is to sort of advocate, make sure everything goes forward, but interconnect and be the interconnect for the councillors and that to give them that sort of buffering? Um, I, I'm looking over to my side because I'm just quickly Googling um, 
something here because because there's a there's a there's a there's a um, Margaret Strulo down in Rocky. Broadly speaking, we are. Um, I'd hate to think so. Broadly speaking, and I can tell you for a fact that the way that we operate Townsville Enterprise Approach, we have a really close relationship, very good relationship with Townsville City Council, all the councils in our area, and I don't see certainly in my experience and my interactions and the like, I don't see that being a, I'm going to contradict myself in a minute. I don't see that being a um, something that's on the radar and I don't see us having to actively step into a space like that. So there's that answer, my lived experience here at work. But then all you've got to do is you've got to take a look at Margaret Strello, um, the mayor in Rockhampton, who was also a um, ardent supporter of the Adani project and a, a big champion for the opportunity that it was going to create for the people who lived in her city and her region. And then uh, the decision to over on a, on a, she uh, with a contingent of other Australian local and state politicians, including the premier and others traveled to India uh, as guests of Adani, the Adani corporation, I think, and Mr. Adani himself to, uh, yeah, to, to, to essentially see what the coal dug out of the Carmichael project was going to do and to introduce them to the brand and a fairly regular trip. There's nothing, you know, crazy about it in terms of the sorts of trade missions that occur. Uh, and like I said, many other people, highly publicized photos everywhere. And because um, Mayor Strallo didn't and I believe it was something as mundane as it really just wasn't entered or logged in the appropriate manner. It ended up turning into a um, conflict of interest, uh, undeclared gift situation. She ended up resigning and they had a by-election for the mayoralty for the mayor in, in Rockhampton. I think that would have been 2020, maybe 29, uh, 2020 that would have been. So on one hand, I say to you here in Tensile Enterprise, I don't see that. I don't feel as though that's a lived experience necessarily. But then I think for those things, sometimes you don't know about them until they rear their heads. And, and, and maybe there is um, on that quieter level, you know, there, there, there are real lived experiences of it that I can point to in, with companies I've been engaged with in, in the very distant, or very, very recent past. So uh, all I've got is a contradiction for you. On one hand, I hate the thought of that, Bill. I, I think it's a terrible state for us to be in. And, and I'd like to say I don't see it in the day to day and I, I don't see it in the day to day. But I can point to a very recent example of it happening where I can definitely see how politicians might be feeling less inclined to engage with the business community in the fear that, you know, they don't dot an I or cross a T or, you know, do, do whatever um, and have these incredible repercussions come back on them you know, that, 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 that really derail what could otherwise have been quite a spectacular and, and valuable career for the people of their region. Okay, then we'll wind it up there. Um, I'd like to thank you very much for your time. If you just stay on the line, I'll just wind up the show and, um, and come back to you for a short conversation. If you thank, you. thank you. If you enjoyed tonight's show, please like, follow and subscribe to our Facebook page and also subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, next week, we're looking to have one of the uh, members of the Emergency Leaders for Climate Action come on and explain their six point plan in regards going to the going into the future to manage serious and catastrophic events like bushfires in the future. Uh, so please join me then. Thank you.